But I want to thank you. I also want to thank Don Quinn, the late Don Quinn, a great writer who worked with Marion and I for 25 years during the Herbert McGee and Molly show. We started in 1930, thereabouts, and it was 1960 before they found out what was the matter. <laughs> but we were glad of the chance to give a few chuckles here and there. We were also glad of the chuckles that some of these shows gave us. You remember Vic and Sade? Yeah. Lum and Abner? Yeah. Burns and Allen? Molasses in January? Yeah. That was my old friend Tom Brenham. You remember Stoop Nagel and Bud? Yeah. You do? Yes. If you remember them, you're older than I am, boy. On April 12, 1945, radio fell silent for three days, except for news and memorials. FDR had died. Harry Truman stepped into the presidency and into FDR's dream of victory. Radio was there when the war began. It was there on September 1st, 1945, when the Japanese surrendered on the USS Missouri in Tokyo Bay. to herald yet another era in radio. Broadcasting itself had caused tremendous changes in the tastes and lifestyles and sometimes even the philosophies of millions of Americans. And now in the post-war years, looming just ahead at that time, radio itself would undergo dramatic new changes. There would be new problems, new challenges, new period to chronicle. And here's one way all of that was chronicled. fellow with a city named after his show, the adopted son of Truth or Consequences, New Mexico, Ralph Edwards. Truth or Consequences was uh, one of the fortunates that danced from radio into television and is still going strong with our host, Bob Barker. Another program making the transition was Art Linkletter's house party. Now, Mike, uh, have you ever wrapped up anything? No. Do you know anything about it? Yeah, I've seen people wrapping something. Well, would you like to try wrapping something? Yeah. This is the kind of an odd package that we got here for you. Wow. <laughs> have you ever seen anything like this before? <laughs> I know it's not wrapping you. All right, now, uh, there's the paper, Michael. Are you holding? Yeah, I'll hold them. Just grab the big paper up. You better take the big paper. That's it. He's a million boy. He's a what? Um, a big guy, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm one of those kids grown up. And no wonder, because I talked to them for 25 years on the house party. The children were a big part of radio's audience. Fiorella LaGuardia read them the funnies. They listened to Jack Armstrong, Terry and the Pirates, Uncle Don, remember him? And they also listened to the detective shows like The Adventures of Sam Spade. And here is the co-star of that show and thousands and thousands of other shows, Lorene Tuttle.
When I played Effie to Howard Duff's Sam, I had a lot of time on my hands sitting there in the office waiting for Sam to clear up a caper and see a few girlfriends. So I'll tell you a secret. I spent that time keeping up with all those other radio crime chasers. I love a mystery. Dragnet. Of course, we had a lot more, too. But it wasn't all crime. Was it, Corliss? No, Lorene. Remember Corliss Archer? That was me, Janet Waldo. But how about a hand for some of my colleagues? A date with Judy, Ozzie and Harriet, Phil and Alice, Dinah Shore, Jimmy Durante, and Eve Arden. And Alan Young and Phil Baker with the $64 question. The Life of Riley with Bill Bendix. And Judy Canova. Remember, park your carcass and the mad Russian? Bob Burns, Henry Morgan, Joan Davis, Ransom Sherman? Hey, you! You left out Duffy's Tavern. Gould, and I was Miss Duffy. <laughs> I was the second Miss Duffy. The first was Eddie Gardner's wife, Shirley Booth. Oh, now, and what about all the Jacks, huh? Jack Carr, and Jack Kirkwood, and Jack Carson, and Jack Webb. <laughs> You've forgotten the king of jacks, my old boss. Oh, look who's here. No, Jack Benny. From Hollywood, the Jack Benny program. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight, my, um, look, look, the, the spotlight is supposed to follow me wherever I go. No, no, right here. Here I am. Thank you. And watch it, Mary. <laughs> save I can keep, you see. Well, we've still got a couple of weeks in case you change your mind about Nevada. Bill, if you mention Nevada once more, you'll be back leading the orchestra on the Albany night boat. <laughs> well, at least they threw nickels at me. What do you think I do every Saturday? Jack Benny's Maxwell. <laughs> you know, Jack had seen me in the cartoons and heard me, and he called me in and he had a bear in the basement called Carmichael that was guarding his vault. So he said, Mel, can you do the growl of a bear? And I said, why not? And I did it. <laughs> he said, great, you're on next week. So I uh, did the growl of a bear for six months. That's all I did was a growl of the bear. Finally, I said, you know, Mr. Benny, I can also talk. Well, Jack fell down and pounded the floor. He said, Swell, I have the writers write something in for you. So one of the writers, I think it was Milt Josephsburg, wrote in, we were visiting England at Epsom Downs, a horse race track, and he writes in, Mel does an English horse winnie. How can you tell the nationality of a horse? I didn't want to disappoint him, so I did an English horse winnie, like this. <laughs> Oh, no, it's not. Not by a long shot. If we're doing This Is Your Life radio, we can't forget a couple of fellas. Ralph is right. And sitting right out there, right tonight, is one of them, Eddie Rochester Anderson. And there's another fellow. 
Costello and his partner, who started with Rudy Valley, moved on to their own Chase and Sanborn Hour and are still going strong. Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy. <laughs> As I was watching this show, you know, yeah, I, I was thinking of the old days uh, when, when we first were on radio. Yeah, oh, what fun. That, uh, you know, we had fun in 20 years of it. Yeah. Life has been good, hasn't it? Yes, it has, yeah. Do you have any regrets? No, no. If I had my life to live over again, I'd like to make the same mistakes. Yes. <laughs> Only start sooner. Yes, I figured that. Yeah. <laughs> well, you certainly made plenty of them. Well, I tried. Yes, yes. <laughs> And I always forgave you. Yeah. Yes. I, I was a pretty decent fellow, wasn't I? Uh, yeah, you were all right. I'll say one thing for you. Success hasn't changed you at all. Well, thank you. You're still the same tight lot. Yeah, I see. Yeah. <laughs> Since I discovered you. Since you discovered me. Yeah. Yeah. Where would you be without me? Well, where would you be without me? All right, all right. I've never seen it to fail, though. You pick up a nobody on the street. Yeah. Make him a big success, and what do you get in return? Nothing. That's right. You never even thank me. All right, all right. <laughs> well, maybe we need each other then. I think so, but... I do remember, now we're carrying on like we did with Bill Fields, but those were the days. Good old Bill. Yes. Remember when Bill Fields once said to you, is it true, Charles, that your father was a gate-leg table? Yeah. <laughs> and I told him, if it is, his father was under it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's right. Yeah. Another one I remember was when May, I asked Mae West if she ever found the one man she could really love, and she said, yes, lots of times. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> remember when I was going to marry Marilyn Monroe? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I, I remember while I was waiting for the wedding to take place, I tuned in on the radio, and I got an overseas broadcast. And I heard the voice of, of Winston Churchill. Yeah. And he said, this is America's darkest hour. If Charles McCarthy insists on marrying Miss Monroe, I have only this to say. Never before has one so little taken so much from so many. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think we better close our memory book and say good night. Good night. Yes. <laughs> Thank you all, and in the words of Lowell Thomas, so long until tomorrow.